You know, I, I, I remember the time when Jesus was in Gethsemane in the garden and, and as he prayed. That was his training. That was his work. And then the cross was his race. How are you doing for your cross? Are you training? Now, discipline may stir up some negative feelings. Discipline can sure be done wrong and with bad motives. However, discipline done correctly and with the proper motives and responses is a required part of the church. Looking back about 450 years ago in church history, when the church was at the state and it had the power to torture or even put to death the erring brothers through church discipline. A group of reformers wrote up a list of beliefs that contrasted with what the ch state church was about. The rule of the day. And one of the contrasts was their manner of church discipline. But even though this then current activity of discipline was abusive and wrong. The true church continued to place discipline high on the activity list through the reformation of the church. A reformer named de Bras prepared a confession in the year 1561. In the following year, a copy was sent to King Philip II. And together with an address in which the petitioners declared that they were ready to obey the government and all the, the rules of the government. But they would offer their backs to stripes, their tongues to knives, their mouths to gags, and their whole bodies to the fire. Rather than deny the truth expressed in this confession that, that de Grasse wrote up, and although the immediate purpose seemed to seemed at, at securing freedom of from the persecution was not attained, and De Bras himself was killed, he lost his life, and many thousands of others who sealed their faith with their lives. His work has endured, has endured, and will still con, and will continue to endure. Um, that's a quote. The Confessions that de Bras prepared is called the Belgic Confession. And it's still a confession of the Roman, I mean not the Roman, the Reformed Church of today. It was the reaction of the tyranny of the state church and, and how the state church had got many things wrong. It's a reaction of the unbiblical means of the way the church was operating. That forced submission to its religion. De Bras was killed under the discipline of the church. But even amid the discipline of the leaders of the church then, the Belgic Confession includes discipline as one of the marks of the true church. And I'm just going to read from Article 29 of this confession. And it reads, The true, the true church can be recognized if it has the following marks. The church engages in the pure preaching of the gospel. It makes use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ instituted them. It practices church discipline for correcting faults. In short, it governs itself according to the pure word of God, rejecting all things contrary to it, and holding Jesus Christ as the only head. By these marks, one can be assured of recognizing the true church and no one ought to be separated from it. That's out of that, that confession, the Belgic Confession. You know, many, many die horrific deaths holding on to the words of the confession. You know, this was not just some popular view to, to gain, to gain uh, power or to, to hold uh, the, the state accountable to, to grasp for freedom. May we respect the scripture that explains what they believed in. May we see that it is a part, discipline, as a part of the clear teaching that many gave their lives for. 
You know, last week I talked about how Cat and I disciplined our children. And to an extent, we're still disciplining our, or discipling our kids. Discipline does not mean punishment. Although it may use punishment from time to time to direct, to coerce, one to right behavior. This is what the, the Webster de defines discipline as. Discipline, the verb tense. Number one is to instruct or educate, to inform the mind, to prepare by instructing in correct principles and habits as to discipline youth for a profession or for future usefulness. Number two, to instruct and govern, to teach rules and practice and accustom to order and subordination as to dis discipline troops or an army. Number three, to correct, to chastise, to punish. And number four, to execute the laws of the church on offenders with a view to bring them to repentance and reformation of life. And five, to advance and prepare by instruction. That's discipline. The church that the Bras was martyred under had it wrong. But that did not mean that discipline was wrong. There's a balance between abuse and neglect. I was, I was hearing that Tyson's fiance Rochelle told a, read a joke off of milk carton yesterday. And, and uh, the question on the, on the milk carton was, why did the circus tiger eat the tightrope walker? A balanced diet. Kind of doesn't get it yet. <laughs> Either that or so stupid. She's like, <laughs> There's a balance between abuse and neglect. <coughs> they had power and control as motive for discipline. That's what the that's what the state government had. God has love and sonship as his motives for discipline. As many of you, as good parents, have also love and sonship for your children. The other extreme of neglect is possibly far more evil than abuse. There's a balance. In Hebrews 12, we'll continue on with verse 5. And you have forgotten that the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son endure hardship as discipline God is treating you as sons for what son is not disciplined by his father if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline then you are illegitimate children and not true sons Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a while, well, for a little while, for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it, see that no one is sexually immoral, or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9.24, please. Now, discipline is a God thing. Discipline is a loving action. It's a preparation action. 
You know, discipline is not always pleasant, but it is not always punishment. I was running the 400s with my track team at a rickery last year. And during this intense, painful workout, I would give each of them a goal, how, how to run their 400. You've got to run it in under uh, a minute 12. You know, and, and tell the next guy, you got to run it in under a minute 15. And, and then we would all start on the starting line and I'd time them all and make sure they got their goal. Well, anyways, about by the seventh lap repeat, we had a minute minute break in between each, each 400. These kids were tired. I was tired. You know, it's amazing how attentive these kids are when they know that the longer you talk, the longer the break is. <laughs> So anyway, I brought up this passage out of, out of 1 Corinthians 9.24. And I said, do you not know that all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. And, as I, was, and I, I brought that scripture up, I said, what do you think this means? Do you think this means that, that you're going you're gonna to run at that race? whether it's state or, or regionals, and that's the race that he's talking about running in such a way to win? You think that's how you run in such a way to win? No, he's talking about what we're doing right here, on this track. We're preparing for that race, preparation. We're disciplining our lives, our bodies, to run for that day. And I said to them, I said, you, who's supposed to run a 112-400, I want you to run a 58-400. I knock 15 seconds of all their times. And I says, this could be our last 400 if you run it under the new goal. Otherwise, we got three more. And we got on that starting line, and I tell you what, most of them broke their previous goal by 30 seconds. They ran in such a way to win. Paul uses this scenario of training for a race, for training for the godly life in Christ. He uses this expression of living the Christian life. Now the church, the body of Christ, is a team running for the prize, training for the race set before it. Disciplining, encouraging, building one another up to run in such a way to get the prize. Let's, let's back up a few chapters to 1 Corinthians 5, 12, please. You know, discipline is a mark of the church. It's a mark of the team and a mark of true sons. If individuals on my track team never have discipline to prepare for the race, they never make it for the race. In fact, according to the guidelines of our track team, they wouldn't even be on the team. Out of Hebrews, we read that those that are not disciplined are not true sons. We read about the discipline of God, like the Father disciplining His children out of Hebrews. But where does discipline of the church fit in? Now why after the huge avert, abuse of discipline in the state churches back, in, back 450 years ago and even farther back, and even probably closer, I mean we still saw some in the colonies here. Why after such huge abuse of discipline would the reformers include discipline as one of the marks of the true church. You know, we can make some rather practical arguments. You know, why not leave it up to the Lord? You know, we're not supposed to judge. You know, judge so that you be not judged. For in the same manner you judge, you will be judged. Isn't God the only righteous judge? He judges the heart. But the Bible, however, puts discipline of the members of Christ's body into the realm of the church itself. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, he says, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? 
Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. This challenge comes after discussion about of an immoral man accepted into the church. And, and we'll go back up all the way to verse 1 in, in 1 Corinthians 5. And just to get, get a view of the story. And, uh, and Paul's getting on the church and says, Man, what's going on with you guys? You've got a job to do. You're missing out. You're, you're just letting it go. You're neglecting. And neglect is not love. It's not grace. In verse 1 we read, it is actually, Paul, Paul writing this to the Corinthian church, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not even occur among pagans. A man has his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I've already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy and swindlers or adulterers. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Now this is one of many examples of discipline in the church by the church members. You know, and as we read Paul's discourse on how to deal with the unrepentant sin in the church, there's a repetitive action that the church and its members and that he constantly brings up in this passage. In verse 2, we, we, we get out, it says, put out of your fellowship the man who did this. Verse 5, it says, hand this man over to Satan. Verse 7, it says, get rid of the old yeast. Verse 9, it says, do not associate with sexual immoral, sexually immoral people. Verse 11, that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, greedy, adulterer, or a slanderer, or a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man do not need. And verse 13, it says, Expel the wicked man from among you. Seven times, Paul brings up a form of disassociation as a final discipline for the immoral in verse... for the immoral. And in verse 11, he includes anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, an adulterer, idolater, or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Church discipline has seen many forms throughout history of the church to get conformity. You know, the church has twisted many arms. And that's not the right way to go about it. And they've used all kinds of means. You know, just, just to, like the address of the Belgic Confession, uh, when they were presenting it to the state church or to the state. They said they would offer their backs to strikes, their tongues to knives, their mouths to gags, and their whole bodies to the fire. <clears throat> now that was church discipline back then. The church had overstepped their bounds. 
They were reading this passage out of Corinthians for sure. That was way past their, their pay scale. Those forms of discipline that operated then are not true church discipline, but often the marks of the persecution of the church, the true church. The church will be persecuted by various abusive means from the world or the false church. The true discipline of the members within the church is done lovingly. And the goal is not conformity, but restoration and transformed lives. You know, seven times Paul brings up a form of disassociation as a discipline. In just this passage, dealing with an unrepentant sinner in the church. You know, true repentance cannot be forced. And when all the loving means of forgiveness, of trying to, with all that is within you to live at peace with them, and striving for restoration, maybe even expo exposing some of the harmful deeds or actions or, or processes that, that their sinful action is going to cause on them. And all the explanation done, and when all those things have been exhausted, there's, and there's still no repentance, the Bible makes it clear to give up. Disassociate. And hand them over to Satan. Now there's no arm twisting, brainwashing means, or even the threat of death to force conformity. That's not part of the discipline of the church. The final discipline of the church is more or less releasing them to experience the consequences of the choices they, they clearly choose to make. You know? We, we read about codependency. And so many times we like to enable people and, and protect them for their own, from their own consequences. That's not grace. Sometimes we just got to let them go. You know, like the model that God gave for disciplining members in the church, God does not force himself on anyone. He does, not, he does the same with his offer for salvation. Whosoever will. Anyone who hears... God's message of salvation can take it or leave it. God doesn't strike you with lightning or, or, or threaten you say, hey, you know, if you don't believe in me, here's your punishment right now, here now. God does not twist your arm to conform. He does not bribe you with riches or, or even chemically arrange the chemicals in your brain to where you're going to say yes. He lets you come to Him through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, of your own choice and will. It's your choice whether you want to experience His sweet fellowship forever in heaven or whether you want 